So I want to I want to make sure we're all on the same page, <laughs> and I want to make sure that uh, we we're, we're start we're seeing this picture because what we what we've seen from the beginning of the study up until now is that every attempt at reestablishing God's kingdom, you know, you know in, the, in the way that God intended, like it was in Eden, it, it failed. Uh, it failed in, in Eden, and then every attempt after that, it failed. Uh, failed in establishing the nation after they left Egypt. It failed in Canaan. Uh, it failed on multiple occasions. <clears throat> and so God sent prophets he sent those to speak his word to the, to his people in, in order to get them to repent uh but the thing about it was that nothing was going to succeed as long as human beings were the primary players who had to carry it out and so we what we talked about last week this divine misdirection and that god coming himself but having to do so undercover to circumvent any plans that the enemy might have to try to thwart uh, what God was trying to do and, and coming in the person of Jesus. Now, you know, we've talked all uh, long about uh, God showing up in types, right? We talked about the rock in the wilderness. We talked about uh, God showing up as the angel of the Lord, his word showing up to Abraham. <laughs> and we talked about many different places where uh, God actually showed himself, but not fully. Uh, but now we get into the point where a picture is becoming clearer. We talked last week about how all these different puzzle pieces in a mosaic came together in the person of Jesus, but that those puzzle pieces were kind of scattered throughout the Old Testament so that, again, any plans that the enemy would have because you know the enemy is always trying to overthrow what God is doing. Any plans that the enemy will have uh, would, would be for nothing because they wouldn't know the details. They wouldn't know anything until it hit them. They wouldn't, in other words, it was almost like a, like a sneak attack. Uh, they wouldn't know until, they, until it hit them what had happened. And so now <clears throat> we get into the point and from the Old Testament kind of transitioning into the New Testament with where we see Jesus as this messianic son of man, right? The son of man is a messianic title, even though uh, God called Ezekiel the son of man, that, that title also uh, is ascribed to Jesus on multiple occasions. And so now we see <clears throat> that there are earthly aspects to the kingdom of God and that people are directly involved in establishing the kingdom and promoting the kingdom. But then there's a divine aspect and that only God can truly establish this thing and is not going to fully take root. It's like what one Bible scholar call a tension between already and not yet. So it's already here, but it's not yet fully established because when it's fully established, that will mean that that's going to be the time where Jesus actually returns and judges the earth and judges his enemies and judges those who uh, refused him and denied him and refused to get saved. But then he also is going to sit on his throne and we, those who are believers, are going to reign with him. So that's where the gathering comes in. All the people who were scattered from the disinheritance, people who were scattered for, for different uh, ch uh, chastisements whether they were sent to Babylon or whether they were sent to Assyria or whether they were sent to uh, some other place. <laughs> um, this gathering happens as a result of Jesus finally bringing the kingdom to its uh, culminating point. And so with that being said, we're going to talk now about Jesus as the cloud rider. And, and again, this is a uh, Old Testament um typology but it's also a new testament uh observation too because that's this is something that jesus said himself when he was in the presence of uh of pontius pilate so even <clears throat> in the old testament every king was believed to be uh instituted by by god 
whether it's God, Yahweh, or a God. A king was what they call quasi-divine. It's like a person who, who either Yahweh or some other God uh, installed as a leader of a particular nation. And so when, when we get to Israel, talking about Israel, the king of Israel, of course, we started with <clears throat> excuse me, Saul as the first king. And then after that, uh, David, and then a lineage that, that spanned from David up until uh, the destruction of Israel and the captivity and all of that, right? The king of Israel was also considered a son of God, right? A son, meaning one who God has instituted, one who is in the lineage uh, of this divine um, appointment. And so when we think about um, the kings that were legitimate, as scripture speaks about the Davidic lineage, right? The only kings that were legitimized were kings who came from the Davidic lineage, right? So from David to Solomon and anybody after that, but they had to come from that Davidic lineage. <clears throat> and the, the lineage is so important that even Jesus, I talked about this before, even Jesus, when he came in human form, Joseph could not be his biological father because the, line, the side of the lineage that Joseph was from was cursed. He was from the, the lineage of a king, uh, Jeconiah, who <clears throat> because of his refusal to listen to the prophet Jeremiah, God cursed him and said that he'd never have another man, you know, to follow him and sit on the throne. And so even Joseph could not be the biological father of Jesus, but Mary happened to be from the other side of the family. And so because of her, the, the, the uh, curse that was on uh, Joseph's side of the family did not get passed down to Jesus, but Joseph was the legal heir. And so he brought, the, the legality to the table where Mary brought the fact that uh, she was from the right side of the family. So all of that kind of came together when they uh, were married, when they became betrothed to one another. All right, so, it, so the king of Israel was, his job was to carry out God's plans. It's that plain and simple. His job was to carry out God's plans and, and that's it. So that would be a, final messiah you know we talked about this last week that the word messiah or the term messiah is used uh 36 times in the old testament <clears throat> but it simply means anointed one but there will be a final messiah a the final son of david the, the uh stem from the root of jesse who would be both divine and human at the same time and we know that that is a reference to Jesus, right? We talk about the divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ coexisting. Uh, if, you, if you look that up in a, a book dealing with Christian theology, it, it, there's a term for it. It's called the hypostatic union. In other words, it is a 100% human and 100% God at the same time. But Jesus would be the one who embodied uh, the fullness of the deity who is who is God the Father and also he is a son of David uh, even even Bartimaeus called him son of David when he was walking on the road and Bartimaeus was blind and wanting to get Jesus's attention so that Jesus could heal him he called him son of David which is a messianic title all right so <clears throat> who, who who is the Messiah and, and how do um how does the Messiah interact with this divine council? And that's where we are tonight in Daniel 7. Uh, dealing with the, the divine council of Yahweh as well as the Messiah. And there is an intersection and it happens in Daniel chapter 7. And we're going to look at all from verse 1 down to verse uh, 14. So let, let's turn to that.
Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through uh, 14. I'm going to read it in sections because there is a, a legitimate <clears throat> political part to this, not politics as we think about it, but politics in the sense that, you know, there were other kingdoms in the, in the earth and those kingdoms were in opposition to God's kingdom. Because if you remember, the, the, one of the things that we talked about was that at the, uh, in Deuteronomy 32, that Israel was God's portion. And all the other nations were kind of allotted to lesser gods. And so any kingdom that was raised up outside of Israel was immediately uh, and by default in, in competition with Israel and also uh, any kingdom that raised that was raised up was in opposition to God's kingdom. All right, so uh, in Daniel 7, 1 through 8, it talks about these four beasts. And those beasts, actually, when, when Daniel interprets this vision, or when he's given the interpretation of the vision, uh, he's actually told or taught that these beasts represent empires. So let's look at Daniel 7, <clears throat> verses 1 through 8. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. And then it says, then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. It says, Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. <clears throat> and it says, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea. Now, anytime you see again, when it's talking about the sea, that's a reference to chaos, right? When it talks about the sea being stirred up, that's always a reference to chaos. And these kingdoms were... Number one, they were chaotic, but they also caused a lot of chaos because they, uh, the, the different empires that these beasts represented all had some element of conquering, right? They would conquer other empires. They would conquer other kingdoms, other peoples. And it says, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, a human mind also was given to it. And then it says, verse five, and behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side and three ribs were in his mouth between his teeth. And, and they said to it, arise and devour much meat. And then verse six says, after this, I kept looking and behold, another one like a leopard which had on his back four wings, and it says, four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after it, after this, I kept looking in the night visions, verse seven, and behold, a fourth beast, <clears throat> dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and pressed and trampled down the remainder with his feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had 10 horns. Verse eight, while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up from among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it, and behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts, right? And so when you, if you keep reading, the, the, the beasts are actually interpreted. Right. Um, and they are they are kingdoms. And one of them, uh, I think, the, if I'm not mistaken, the bear represents Persia. And then the lion represents Babylon and the leopard represents uh, Greece or Rome. And then the uh, the fourth. No, I'm, I'm sorry. The leopard represents Greece. And then the fourth beast. <clears throat> who is a, uh, it says, dreadful and terrifying, extremely strong, with large iron teeth, represents Rome. So Israel was never free after it, after it came out of captivity 
and it rebuilt the temple a second time after that second destruction of the temple. Israel was always under the governance of some larger empire. All right, so then it says, so the, the beasts again are empires that have to be dealt with. And this is the political part of this. And in addition to the spiritual and the theological part of it, because these empires, if you go back and you read the book of Revelation, you will understand when he's talking about beasts or nations uh, that are empires, they are empowered by the great dragon, right? And so any kingdom that's in opposition to God's kingdom is by default empowered by a power that's not God, right? So that's why when you see all these other nations and all these other empires, they're not empowered by God. They're empowered by some lesser God or some other being, uh, and they have to be dealt with. And that's one of the reasons why the Messiah has to come to deal with any kingdom that exists in opposition to God's kingdom. Uh, and that's good news for us, because when you think about it, we, we are a part of God's kingdom, but there are two kingdoms that coexist at the same time, right? There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of darkness and they coexist. And that's why the world looks the way it looks because that kingdom of darkness is proliferating, you know, at a, at a uh, astronomical rate. And so the, the more time passes, the more it looks to us sometimes like the kingdom of darkness is winning. But the game ain't over yet, right? So that's, that's, that's what uh, we as believers hold on to, the fact that the game is not over yet. Amen. Thank you, sister. If I see that, I see that, I see that. Yeah, he covered all the bases before we even knew it would matter. Praise the Lord. You are right about that. You are right about that. Amen. And so let's go to the next bullet. And, and, and with that, look at the next set of verses. And Daniel 7, verses 9 through 12. So here's the, here's the, the, uh, the, here's the part that is the good news, is that in spite of these empires being powerful, uh, if you notice, when, it, when the Persian Empire was a bear, and it, it's described as having three ribs in his mouth between his teeth. You know, that is that is the Persian Empire conquering Babylon. So the it, it eating uh, is a symbol of it being, you know, conquering the, the previous empire that preceded it. Uh, you see how I talked about Rome, how I talked about the iron teeth and all of that. <clears throat> That's on purpose because a lot of times, even in Daniel, when you read about uh, the image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about, right? I think it, uh, scripture says it had clay feet, it had bronze, it had gold, all of these things. Every, every description pointed to some aspect of history and some aspect of an empire, right? The bronze, you know, is indicative of the fact that they were in an age where bronze was becoming, you know, a, a metal, a popular metal. So when it talks about iron, again, when 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 uh, society started to do metallurgy and started to develop uh, weapons made of iron and not just uh, wood or some other brittle metal or something like that, it mattered because if you had iron, that means you had power because you could develop weapons that were stronger than your enemies. So all of these things, when you read them. They may sound esoteric and, and they may sound weird, but everything has a purpose. Uh, so let's go to the next uh, bullet. <clears throat> it says the divine council is seated in heaven in the presence of the ancient of days. Verse nine says, I kept looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days took his seat. Now, the first thing you notice there in verse nine is that thrones is plural. Right. And, and, and if you think about the plurality of that, just like we talked about in Genesis, when God said, let us make man in our own image, the plural. Yes, it, it, there, there's a throne there for Jesus. Right. But 
if we keep reading, we're going to see that there are multiple thrones set up, not just two. It says, until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat, <clears throat> his vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool and his throne was ablaze with flames, his wheels were burning fire. That The whole description of wheels and fire, same description that Ezekiel gave. And it says, a river of fire was flowing uh, and coming out from before him. And look at what it says. Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. Here's the part right here where we talk about these multiple thrones, not just two thrones. It says the court sat and the books were open. So when it talks about the court sitting, that is a, um, that's a description of that divine council. Those are other Elohim, those other spiritual beings who are there with Yahweh, uh, the God the Father, who assist in carrying out decrees and who assist in <clears throat> doing uh, work in the spiritual realm. Not just angels, not just seraphim, not just cherubim, but also these other Elohim or lesser spiritual beings to, to Yahweh. And it says, and, and the court set and the books were open. Verse 11. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. <clears throat> so that little horn that came up out of the out of the last empire, and, and uh, many Bible scholars say that that is a, a reference to Alexander the Great. Uh, but it came up, it says, while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one came up from them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots. Uh, before it and behold this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and mouth uttering great boast so Daniel says in verse 11 then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and giving given to the burning fire verse 12 this is the beauty of again the, the, the coming of the, the kingdom of God as for the rest of the beast, look at what it says. Their dominion was taken away. So in other words, I have allowed you time and I've allowed you to reign and I've allowed you to do certain things in the earth, but now your time is up. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. So God controls everything. He controls how long, he controls the number of days, and he controls the date of judgment because it said it, it gave them an extension of life. Their dominion was taken away, but they were allowed to exist. An extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. And then it says in the next bullet, because see, it's the council and the, the court that's going to pass judgment on these beasts. And you're going to see that here. Right? That verse 12 is, is, the, is the judgment of the courts, of the council in heaven. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away. So that was their punishment. Their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. And then we go to the next section. It says the divine Messiah is presented. So this is a, an Old Testament picture of Jesus. And it says here, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the son of man was coming. So there's that title, the messianic title, son of man. One like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days. So there <clears throat> you can see something else powerful in this is that the son of man who was co coming in the clouds uh, came up to the ancient of days. That's a, that's a name that's used for Yahweh, the father, God, the father. He came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. Now, nobody is allowed into God's presence without God's permission. And here, uh, this son of man, this Messiah comes into God's presence. And it says, uh, and notice it's not like with the prophets. 
He's not bowing down. He's not afraid. He's not uh, trembling in fear. He's not afraid that he's going to die if he sees the Ancient of Days face to face. The reason for that is simple. The Messiah that's being the, the, the son of man, the cloud rider who's being presented here is also God, right? So it, it gives us this idea of Jesus, uh, who in the Old Testament is pictured here as this son of man coming on the cloud, being equal to Yahweh, the God, the father. And there's another scripture we quote all the time <clears throat> when we talk about in John chapter one, when it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so we see now this son of man this in the presence of the ancient of days being equivalent to him. And that's important because again, the Messiah that's, that's promised would be both divine and human, 100% God, 100% man at the same time. That's why scripture says in him, all the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell. But in the same passage of scripture in Colossians chapter one, it says that it was the blood of Jesus that uh, reconciled us to God. And so if that's the case, <clears throat> if all the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell in this body and that body was able to shed blood, that means that that was a human body. And that was God embodying human flesh for one purpose. And that was, that a purpose was to reconcile man back to himself through his own blood. Uh, let's look at what it says, verse 14. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Now, here's, here's another clue. <clears throat> that this son of man coming on the clouds is eternal. It says that his dominion is an everlasting dominion. So unlike the beasts who had their dominion taken away, the son of man has an everlasting dominion. So this Messiah has an everlasting dominion. And it says, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now keep in mind, all the beasts that they talked about, they destroyed each other. One beast would come and be more powerful than another empire and overtake it. And then another empire would, would rise up and overtake the one that preceded it. But here it says that the, the dominion of the son of man is everlasting, meaning it cannot end and it will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So this is the divine Messiah, and this is the same idea that we were talking about, it was several months ago, of these two, this two Yahweh figures uh, in heaven, or two powers in heaven, which uh, many in Judea Judaism ascribe to, they believe that. Uh, it's only when you talk about Yahweh becoming flesh and the Messiah having already come where they disagree. But they, but there are, uh, that is a that is a, a belief among many in Judaism that there are at least two Yahwehs, one in heaven and one who can uh, travel between heaven and earth, and that we, but we know now based on what we know from the New Testament, <clears throat> that the one who's able to come here, the one who came from heaven, is Jesus. All right, so, so what is it about this, the clouds? Because the clouds are, are indicative, again, of godhood. Because nobody can control the clouds or control the weather. No human being can control the weather or the clouds, but a divine being can. And so in, in the culture that, cultures that existed here and in, in the cultures that preceded the time when uh, Daniel was written, Baal was considered the cloud rider. He, his, his claim to fame was that he could control the elements. He can control the weather. He can control the clouds, the rain, the thunder, the lightning, all of that, right? And, and it was Baal who was 
<laughs> the the uh, main god of Mesopotamia, the main god of Babylon, and so on and so forth. All these other places where Israel would be lured to idolatry. The, the main god in Canaan, when they went to Canaan, to the promised land. And so it was Baal who was constantly luring Israel into idolatry and, and false worship. But if you were able to ride the clouds, that, mean, that meant that you were a god, point blank, right? And so when you see Daniel say that I saw, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, that's Daniel pointing out that the one who we call the son of man, who we now know is Jesus, is God. And, and they took the status of Baal as the cloud rider and gave it to Yahweh as a, as a, a slight, as if to say uh, Baal is not the cloud rider, Yahweh is. And so we see that in several places. So let's turn to uh, Deuteronomy 33 and verse 26. Deuteronomy 33 and 26. It says uh, in verse 26, there's none like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to your help. So not, when, when you hear the word heavens, that's just talking about the sky, right? And we know that clouds exist in the sky. It says, there's none like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to your help and through the skies in his majesty. I'll read 27 too, the eternal God is a dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he drove out the enemy from before you and said, destroy. So again, it's giving Yahweh these cloud riding, uh, sky dwelling, and, and, and able to uh, ride the heavens. It's giving him those properties and, and not Baal. Uh, let's go to um, Psalm 68. Psalm 68, verses 12 through 33. It says this, uh, Psalm 68, verses 32 and 33, sing, oh, sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth, sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides upon the highest heavens, which are from ancient times, behold, he speaks forth with his voice, a mighty voice. So again, you see that ascribing to him the ability to ride on the clouds, right? Taking that away from Baal and giving it to Yahweh. Uh, Psalm 104, verses 1 through 4. Let's look at that. <clears throat> it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. Verse 3, he lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the cloud his chariot. So again, he's able to ride on the clouds. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. Verse four, he makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. And then if we look at Isaiah 19 and one, again, you're going to see the same theme, that it's not Baal who's the cloud rider, but it is our God who, uh, who we know as Yahweh. Isaiah 19 and verse 1 it says the oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. So again, when we talk about seeing the son of man coming on the clouds, that's number one. It's a, it's a, a testament to his, his godhood. But then number two, it's also a testament to the fact that he's God and Baal is not. Uh, so the son of man that Daniel was pointing to here is the same son of man from the New Testament. <clears throat> and what that name means literally is human one. It means human one. Uh, and so, again, when we talk about 
the Messiah. The Messiah is a son of man, meaning a human one. He is 100% human. He is 100% God. And we use this phrase in the New Testament to describe Jesus's humanity, right? Because he had to be, you think about what Jesus came to accomplish and how he accomplished it. If, matter of fact, let me, let me get it right quick. If he was to accomplish reconciliation, he'd have to do so through his own blood. Uh, scripture tells us that in, in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats was no longer enough. And so in order for Christ, Jesus Christ to come and shed his own blood, uh, he had to put on flesh. And in, in order for him to put on flesh, he had to inhabit a body. <clears throat> but he never, at any point during his ministry, any point during his walk, he never uh, became not God, right? What he did was, uh, as Paul wrote in Philippians, he emptied himself, not of his godhood, but he took off his, his glory. But he was still 100% God, even though he was in a human body. Um, let, 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 me, let me find this real quick in uh, Colossians. Because again, in order for him to reconcile us, the only way to do that was for him to shed his blood, his shed his blood, because there's no blood that was worthy of our souls, and there's no blood, other blood that was worthy of forgiving our sins but the blood of Jesus. So it says in Colossians uh, twenty one and twenty one, <clears throat> and although you were you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, verse twenty two, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body. So that is the, about the fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Now, let me read uh, another part of Colossians that talks about the fact that uh, Jesus was fully God because it says in verse, 10, verse 19, for it was the father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And so not only dwelling in his human body was the humanity of Jesus, but it was also his godhood because all the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell in Jesus. So when we look at that Old Testament phrase, son of man is, is pointed to his humanity, but it's also a messianic term. Uh, and so let's look at <clears throat> real quick. Luke 17, verses 24 and 25. Luke 17, verses, we're almost done. Uh, this is the last slide, I think. Luke 17, verses 24 and 25. Look at what it says. It says, um, Luke 17, 24 and 25, for just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to another part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Verse 25, but, he must, but, he fir but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will, all, so it will be also in the days of the, of the Son of Man. Verse 27, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, and they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So you see, even Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. And if Daniel says, I saw one like the son of man standing before the ancient of days, and Jesus calls himself the son of man, we can make the connection that they are one and the same. Uh, let's look at Luke 24 and 26. Luke 24 and verse 26. And, and, and I also want to point this out too. Uh, I also want to point this out too, that if you notice in that last passage in, in Luke 17, 25, he talks about having to give himself, having to die, having to give himself over and be rejected by this generation. And last week we talked about 
the fact that any Messiah had to meet certain criteria, right? They had to be a, a, a son, they had to be a servant, they had to suffer, uh, they had to die, and they also had to be re uh, resurrected. Uh, Luke 24 and 26, uh, it says, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? So again, you see the, the suffering part of the, the messianic mission uh, in addition to entering into his glory after the suffering. So the next bullet says the son of man, cloud rider descriptions merge in Jesus's trial before Caiaphas. So let's look at that real quick, Matthew 26, and then we'll be done. Verses 63 through 66. In verse 63, uh, Matthew 26, it says this. Jesus said to him, you said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you hereafter. <clears throat> in other words, after all these things have happened, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now watch what happens after this, because Jesus saying this is an outright admission that he is the one who Daniel was talking about. And he's the one who's going to be, again, he was all coming on the clouds, standing before the ancient of days then. And when he comes again, it's going to be in the same capacity to be the judge of all the kingdoms of the earth, to judge them with the sword of his mouth and to destroy them and take away their dominion. It says, uh, verse 65, then the high priest tore his robe and said, he's blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, he deserves death. And then verse uh, 67 says, they, then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists. And the others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, you Christ or you Messiah, who is the one who hit you? So all of the imagery from the Old Testament of this Messiah comes together right here in 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 uh, in Jesus's trial before Caiaphas and we know how that ended we know that Jesus ends up dying on the cross only to be resurrected on the third day and that's the good news and he's coming back <laughs> and when he's come when he comes back he's coming back riding on the clouds with the same intentions that Daniel spoke about to judge the nations and to eradicate them and take their dominion away and finally and for you know forever eternally establish god's kingdom so that's that's good news for all of us and he won't unlike the others who came you know trying to set up god's kingdom or work to to establish god's kingdom he won't fail he won't fail All right so so the messiah is the, the coming messiah is a message of hope and especially knowing that it's God himself who's taking on the role of Messiah and not sending a mere human being to do what only God could do. All right, so with that said, we're going to stop here. And then next week, we have uh, one more section, one more chapter out of this section, and then we'll be moving on to another section uh, that moves us into the New Testament. Are there any, uh, any questions or comments? Go ahead, Sister Yvette. You know, I always got to come and I'm sorry, y'all. No, it's good. You're I good. just, I just want to say how it really touched me and how the spirit really moved that for years, you know, I've been taught you don't cast your pearls to swine, but you have a lot of people that question, oh, well, why Joseph was his father if he really can be his father? And you just pointed it out and made it so clear. Our feeble minds, not to, you know, down us, but God yeah. already knew that the legality portion had to be covered yeah. and it just brought it all into a whole picture so thank you for breaking it down i'm 47 years old have loved the lord for as long as i can remember and my thing is i got to fight that battle with you and i would always go to the same scripture to kind of back up you know not how you don't always question god's plan but he saw way beyond our knowledge that he knew what we was gonna have to prove to man he mm -hmm. knows you know like they said 
give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Right. Right. It all falls back to just that again, why Mary was the mother, why Joseph had to be his father. And it just makes me feel good that the Holy Spirit is still working in us to be able to receive that and make it make sense. Amen. This many years in. Amen. Amen. And, and and once you know that, then it all it it all begins to coalesce, right? We get a we get a better yes. picture of who Jesus is, and the fact that how what what was even more is how God kept His promise to David. Yes, He kept mm -hmm. His promise to that He told David in the seventh chapter of the book of First is it First Samuel seven or Second Samuel chapter seven. He told David that you will have a man on the throne forever. Well, we know human beings don't live forever, but the son of man would live forever. And the son of David, who is the son of man, would live forever. And so knowing that, it really helps us to understand how faithful God is to his word, uh, that he would take all these different circumstances that led to the coming of Christ and maneuver all that stuff around and put things in place right how it's supposed to be so that when it was time for Jesus to come and to be born, and to be and to put on flesh, it all happened like it was supposed to. So that is that's a major blessing, and I just thank God for His faithfulness. Uh, and and going through, I'm, you, we're talking about millennia now, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, you know, millions of different people, and yet when it was time for Jesus to be born, God had the exact parameters set. So this is how it's going to happen. This is who's going to be involved. And I'm going to keep my promise to David. And I'm going to honor the fact that legally, Joseph would be the legal heir. Man, man you, can't, you, can't even, that's, you can't even write a movie that's, that's, that's uh, laid out that well. 